Well, we're back to talking about uh, Augustine. We've seen the um, struggles of his youth, and then having trained himself as a great public speaker, a great rhetorician, as he would have been known in the ancient world, able to argue a political or a legal case on either side of the issue, uh, he sets off to make his fame and fortune in Italy. And uh, at about the age of 30 arrives in Milan, uh, expecting a brilliant career, and he soon discovers that the word is out that there is a great preacher in, in Milan. And that great preacher is Ambrose. And Ambrose has a profound effect on Augustine because Ambrose is able to show a certain sophistication to Christianity. He's able to show that not all Christians are uneducated, that not all Christians are unable to speak eloquently. And the power of Ambrose as a preacher begins to draw Augustine back towards considering uh, Christianity and beginning to think of uh, Christianity as a viable option. His great problem is that he doesn't feel that he can control his sexual desires and therefore feels he can't really return to the church. And it's that struggle in his life that leads to the famous story of his conversion. He's sitting in a walled garden um, and he hears, he's reading, interestingly enough, St. Athanasius' Life of St. Anthony, the first great hermit in Egypt. And um, so he's reading about this monastic life that uh, St. Anthony led, and he says, he begins to hear a voice like a child playing just over the wall, repeating the words, tola lega, tola lega, tola lega, Latin for take and read, take and read, take and read. And he goes over and he picks up um, the book of Romans and he reads Romans 13, 13. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And that's the moment when Augustine sees himself as converted. Now, it's interesting when we go back and look at Augustine, in point of fact, there are several conversions in Augustine. And this is important if we had time to talk about the whole history of conversion and reflection on conversion. He's first of all converted intellectually by the preaching of Ambrose. And this famous story is what Augustine would have called his moral conversion. He's changed morally uh, in this moment. But he would have gone on to say there's yet a third critical conversion for him, and that's his baptism, his sacramental conversion. And Augustine makes clear in his confessions, his famous book of introspection, that he doesn't really regard himself as converted until he's baptized. That's his moment of identification with the church. That's the moment at which he really changes. So he then returns after his baptism. His mother has died having heard that he was baptized. He returns to Africa in 388 and uh, three years later, he's ordained as a priest, and four years after that, he's elected a bishop uh, in the little town of Hippo. And that's where he'll remain for the rest of his life down till 430 when he dies. He will live out the rest of his life as a bishop there, which is to say he's living out his life as a preacher and a pastor in that place. And uh, a great writer and a great theologian uh, who will increasingly influence those all around him. And he writes voluminously. I mean, it's amazing to look when you think that all of this is written by hand, has to be copied by hand. Um, uh, there are volumes and volumes, big volumes of his writing that he accomplished and made such a profound impact upon the church. One of his early writings was called On the Freedom of the Will. And sometimes we are told by our Roman Catholic friends that Augustine taught the freedom of the will. If you go back and read that treatise, what you discover, it's not on the freedom of the will, it's on the reality of the will. What he's really arguing there is that people have a will, and it's not determined um, in any mechanistic way by anything on the outside. We have to use our wills. God expects us to use our wills. But he makes clear in all of his writing that the way back to God is only when God, by his grace, through his Holy Spirit, works in our will to draw us uh, to himself. Uh, one of his most important books is his little book, The Confessions. 
And I, I commend you reading the Confessions. It's very readable. It's very um, engaging. It's very thoughtful as he talks about um, how God sought him. And right near the beginning, the second, beginning of the second paragraph of the book, he says uh, one of the most famous statements that he made. He writes, For you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they rest in you. Uh, that's one of his great observations. We are made to be in relationship with God, and we will never really be fulfilled until we're in a relationship with God. And in a sense, he saw that as the great foundation for all the preaching, all the apologetic work of the church. People know they're not fulfilled. Uh, they may successfully blind themselves to recognizing it, but in the deepest sense, we are made for God. We are made, the, the, in Latin, it's really directional. We are made pointed toward God, and we're restless until we find rest in him. And so his confession is really the story of his restlessness until he finds God. And uh, I want to talk just a little bit about one of the really remarkable statements in the confession. In the Platonic tradition of the church, um, evil was seen as um, a failure uh, to love properly. In other words, I choose evil because I love something inferior and I neglect what should be my superior love. So if I steal something, I steal it because I want it. I steal it because I want it for what is good about it. And I neglect that it belongs to somebody else and that I should have loved my neighbor more than I loved, for example, the pear that I stole. And so evil is seen traditionally amongst the Platonists as a choice of an inferior love and a neglect of a superior love but evil is always loving something intrinsically good, just in a disordered way. And for us as Protestants, we're often inclined, especially as Calvinists, to say, that seems not fully to grasp how desperate evil really is, how bad evil really is. And although Augustine at times will use this notion of evil as loving too much a lesser love, um, at one point when he thinks back on his youth, uh, we begin to see how Biblical understanding breaks through to uh, make a point on the part of Augustine uh, beyond uh, what he had um, really thought philosophically and theologically. And this is what he writes. Um, he thinks back when he was a boy how he stole pears from a neighbor's tree. And he writes... Your law, O Lord, punishes theft, and this law is so written in the hearts of men that not even the breaking of it blots it out. For no thief bears calmly being stolen from. How do you know that stealing is wrong? Because if anybody steals from you, you're annoyed. Um, not even if he is rich and the other steals through want. Yet I chose to steal, not because want drove me to it, unless a want of justice and a contempt for it and an excess of iniquity. For I stole things which I already had in plenty and of better quality. Nor had I any desire to enjoy the things I stole, but only the stealing of them and the sin. Now you see, he's, he's really coming to a more biblical understanding of, of evil. A traditional Platonist would have said, well, you, you were hungry, you saw the pears, you fell in love with the pears too much, forgetting the neighbor that you should have loved more, so you stole the pears because you desired them. And he says, no, I wasn't hungry. I didn't desire the pears. I just liked doing what was wrong. And there we see how Augustine begins to move beyond just a philosophical understanding of things into a more fully biblical understanding of evil, the problem of evil, the burden of evil that uh, surrounds him. And that is part of what leads him to think so much about grace, about the burden of sinfulness, about the inability of human beings to help themselves. And uh, it's that line of thinking, if, if we're really so caught up in sin, if we're really so perverted by sin, how can we possibly rescue ourselves? And if we're only rescued by God's action, by God's initiative, 
then God must have planned to rescue us from all eternity, from before the foundation of the world. And lo and behold, that's the language you find in the Bible, isn't it? And so it's out of that reflection on sin, out of the reflection on the necessity of salvation, on his reflection on grace, that he comes to his teaching that we're saved by grace alone, according to God's predestinating purpose. And Augustine becomes one of the great ancient theologians to recapture that dimension of Pauline teaching. Uh, Much of the church had skipped over that. Much of the church had not paid much attention to it until Augustine came along. But you see how he's bringing the doctrine of salvation front and center in the life of the church. What's the nature of man? What's the nature of our fallenness? How weak are we in sin? How much does God have to do to rescue us? Uh, Can we be saved? by our cooperation with grace, or are we saved by grace alone? And Augustine, throughout his career then, had to confront various uh, teachers, first of all, Pelagius, who said, uh, well, it's nice to have grace, but actually we can save ourselves without grace. But most of us need a little help from grace, so grace is okay, but we don't absolutely need it. And Augustine just hammered him, really destroyed Pelagius in the theological argument, so that from Augustine's day till today, almost no one in the history of the Western church has ever said, I'm a Pelagian. Augustine just destroyed that argument. And then later in his career, there came the semi-Pelagians. Well, of course, we need grace. Uh, Grace has to come first, but then we have to cooperate with grace. Well, then Augustine turned all the heavy artillery on the semi-Pelagians. He didn't as completely wipe them out. Semi-Pelagian survived, even though his arguments should have destroyed them. Um, And so the whole history of the church from that point on is often typified when a discussion of salvation comes up. Some people saying, well, I'm Augustinian, and others saying, no, you're not, you're semi-Pelagian. Well, no, I'm not really semi-Pelagian. I would rather think of myself as Um, semi-Augustinian. And so there's been this, this movement back and forth in the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, There were 100% Augustinians in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Believe we're saved by grace alone, just the way we believe today. Thomas Aquinas was probably one of them. Anyway, we don't, that's for another day. Um, uh, And the Protestant movement's been troubled by that, hasn't it? I mean, there have been people who said, we're saved by grace alone, that's the only thing to be said. And then there are people who've said, well, we're saved by grace alone and maybe a little something extra that we need to contribute. And so we've had this this struggle, but Augustine is the one who directed our attention to the scripture and its teaching that we're saved by grace alone. And uh, that that has been a huge benefit to the life of the church. Well, what else did Augustine write on? What else did he direct our attention to? One of them is the matter of authority. What is the authority in the life of the Christian community for Augustine. Well, there were two statements of Augustine that the medieval Roman Catholic Church loved to quote. One of them is, I would, have not, I would not have believed the gospel except for the authority of the church. Oh, the medieval church loved that statement. Most frequently quoted sentence out of Augustine in the Middle Ages. I would not have believed the gospel except for the authority of the Catholic Church. What did Augustine mean by that? He said, what he really means by that, I, was, I would never have come to faith except I had a great preacher who taught me. See, it's not about the formal authority of the institution of the church. It's about a preacher who taught him. And he wouldn't have known the faith if there hadn't been a preacher. How shall they hear unless there's a preacher? How shall they believe unless there's a preacher? And, and that's what he's saying there. And he's often been uh, misquoted. Another, another famous statement of Augustine's Um, was uh, the statement, Roma locuta causa finita. Impressive, huh? Uh, Roma locuta causa finita. Finita. Rome has spoken, the matter is settled. Oh, they like to quote that. Rome has spoken, the matter is settled. Well, what they often neglected in the Middle Ages was that Augustine said that when the Bishop of Rome had agreed with him. And when the Bishop of Rome agreed with Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo, then you ought to listen to the Bishop of Rome. 
but not because the Bishop of Rome had authority in himself, but only because the Bishop of Rome at that moment had had enough sense to agree with Augustine. A later Bishop of Rome disagreed with Augustine. Do you know what Augustine said then? Christus locutus causa finita. Christ has spoken, the matter is settled. When the Bishop of Rome didn't agree with him, he couldn't care less what the Bishop, well, I shouldn't say couldn't care less. He was not bound by what the Bishop of Rome said. It was what Christ said then. And so you see very clearly when you study Augustine as a whole that for him, authority is in the scriptures. It's through the study of the scripture that you find the truth. When the Bishop of Rome agrees with the scripture, we need to agree with the Bishop of Rome. When the Bishop of Rome doesn't agree with the scripture, we don't have to agree with the Bishop of Rome. That was really Augustine's uh, position, and it's uh, tremendously important that we understand that and uphold it. Now, what about the sacraments? Uh, Augustine on the sacraments is, uh, is really very interesting. Um, he stresses the importance of the sacraments, but he really does not teach what the medieval Roman Catholic Church teaches. Uh, for Augustine, um, his view of the Lord's Supper, for example, is very close to that of John Calvin. The Lord's Supper is instituted by Christ. It's it's very important, it's a real communion with Christ, but it is not a changing of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Um, some of the medieval theologians said the problem with Augustine is that he's too clear on grace and not clear enough on the Lord's Supper. And what that really means is he's not a medieval Roman Catholic theologian. He really sees the sacraments as being fundamentally spiritual in character. He even said once, believe and you have eaten already. Very interesting comment about the Lord's Supper. Believe and you have eaten already. This shows that faith is foundational to what the sacrament is and how it blesses uh, the Christian. So Augustine's heritage is really an intriguing one. Uh, a, a complex one uh, for the later church. And his, his insight is so profound that he's someone to whom we can return again and again, and we can learn so much from him, but we always have to remember that um, he's not an authority in and of himself. He probably would not have seen himself as uh, entirely an authority. Now, late in his life, he knew that he was having a huge influence on people. And so late in his life, he went back and he went through all of his writings and he wrote a book called Retractions. I probably ought to do that with these lectures on ancient church history. I go back and review it all and say, where did I get things right? Where did I get things wrong? And he, and he corrects himself, things that he'd said when he was younger and now he wants to, to make clear. So he had a sense that his influence was growing, that he had, was making a profound impact on the church and he wanted to be as faithful a teacher as he could be, he wanted to be as clear as he could be, and above all, he wanted to try to be faithful uh, to the scriptures. And so that was his labor, that was his work. And uh, another of his great works that has had a profound impact on the West is um, the work he worked on almost 20 years at the end of his life, his City of God, on the City of God. And... Um, it's a kind of theology of history, one scholar put it. Uh, he looks at the whole of history and tries to see how God is at work in history. And he says, you know, when we look at history, what we need to see is that history is all about the building of two cities. There's the building of the city of God and the building of the city of man. There's the building of the city that wants to honor God. And there's the building of the city that wants to dishonor God. There's the building of Jerusalem, and there's the building of Babylon. Uh, these are the two cities that represent uh, two wholly different approaches to um, understanding what life is about and how we serve God. And intriguingly, Augustine said, these two cities are built on the foundation of two different loves. Uh, either we love ourselves to the contempt of God, which builds Babylon, 
or we love God to the contempt of the self, which builds the heavenly Jerusalem. And so we have to ask ourselves, what controls our lives? What motivates our lives? He said, apart from the grace of God, we are turned in on ourselves and love ourselves. And only by the grace of God are we stretched out towards God and find our life in God. Only by the love of, by the grace of God, are we stretched out to God to love him and to change the whole direction and purpose of our life. And this, this really huge book that he writes on the city of God is an effort to show how that works itself out in history, how uh, ultimately uh, those two cities will be separated forever from one another in the final judgment. But he says part of the problem we face now as Christians it is, is that these two cities have to live side by side. They live mixed together. And uh, this mixed life is what we have to be reconciled to as Christians. And then he says, but where we as Christians can have an influence in this world, we ought to exercise it. And where we can, as Christians, restrain the building of the human city and advance the building of the city of God, we ought to do that. And while that sounds great, and in many ways we can agree with Augustine, we have to recognize that at that point, Augustine is really advancing the notion that Christianity ought to dominate society and that non-Christianity needs to be suppressed and that the power of the state ought to be marshaled by Christians when they can to oppose and forbid non-Christian religions. Um, Augustine probably couldn't anticipate all that would come out of this, but here's really the foundation of the persecution of non-Christians that would take place in the West in the Middle Ages. And it's a kind of cautionary tale for us to remember that when we talk about being an influence in this world, we have to be very cautious that we don't want to be an influence that takes away the rights, the freedoms of other people. And um, really, Augustine began a millennium-long experiment in Christian civilization where really only Christianity was permitted and other forms of religion were oppressed, and it really didn't work very well. Um, Christianity ultimately is never really advanced by coercion. It's really only advanced by persuasion. And uh, I think we really need to be committed to that. So as we come to an end of this lecture, we see Augustine as a great, great influence in so many positive ways. But as shouldn't surprise us, he wasn't perfect. Uh, but he continues to be a great inspiration, a great encouragement, and a great director for us of the way in which we ought to go. Thank you.